hey, the great places I get to visit. Tonight we're going out into the Bermuda Triangle. It's an archipelago of adventure. From hidden caves to ocean depths to abandoned shipwrecks, there's no shortage of exotic exploration to pack into one painting. So join me as we paint the town of Bermuda. I'm Precious Anderson. I'm Paris Anderson, and, um, and we have a three-year-old son and a seven-year-old daughter. It's always been questions. I believe my biological mom gave me my name. I think it was around seven that I actually got adopted. We had visits when I was smaller with my parents. I think I thought the visits would continue afterwards, but that stops. It was heartbreaking to know that this is it, but I had to move on. The smallest things about not knowing her family affects her. It's something as small as not knowing who she looks like, you know, where she gets certain characteristics from. I think my number one question would be, did you ever look for me after the adoption? Like, did you ever try to look and find me? But again, I'm not expecting anything specific. It's just simply being able to see and talk to them, anyone, um, would be nice. I just want her to be at peace with whatever is revealed along this journey. BYU Broadcasting has the following position available. For more information or to apply, visit yjobs.byu.edu. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Good Monday morning, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. We're two weeks into the season now. The Cougars have picked up the road home split win at Arizona last week, followed by a 21-18 home set back to Cal on Saturday. BYU this week heading back out on the road, facing top 10 foe Wisconsin on today's show. It's a review and a preview. We're taking your questions as well for special teams coordinator Ed Lamb and defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki. Coach Lamb in our first half hour and Coach Tuiaki coming up at the bottom of the hour. You are joining us today live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, ESPN 960, and BYU Football Facebook Live. You can also catch us on demand via podcast, online apps, and Facebook. And you're invited to join the conversation by tweeting questions for the coaches using hashtag CCBYU on Twitter or via comments on the BYU Football Facebook Live page. Welcoming in special teams coordinator, linebackers coach, and assistant head coach, Ed Lamb and uh, Coach Lamb, such are the uh, ups and downs of the game, but a pretty dramatic swing in emotion from, from week one to week two. How do you kind of view the last uh, two weeks as a whole? Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I think you, you said it. I, I view it as an emotional swing. We had, uh, you know, we're um, just a few plays away from, um, from, from not being victorious in game one, and, uh, and we made the, the plays down the stretch, the big plays during the course of the game. Any um, any coach on any given Saturday can take a, a handful of plays and point to the difference between winning and losing, and and that's you know if, if the game was anywhere close, that's usually what it comes down to. We did not make those plays this last week, and so we have to learn from the success of week one, and uh, learn learn from the sting of week two, and apply that in week three. Are the handful of plays to which you refer uh, things that you think are quote unquote easy fixes? Um, yes, and and and. In one sense, what I mean by when, when, I, when we talk about when coaches talk like that, well, if, if, it, if it weren't for this player, if this play would have gone different, we would have caught this pass. If we would have, um, if we would have had not broken this coverage, you know, things like that. Um, the reality is, is there's, uh, you know, every play can can be done differently. Every every guy who's playing on the field needs to improve, and every. Um, you know, every, every player has to be every coach and every player should be evaluated for ways we can improve or or possibly have other guys in the game. And that's you know that's that's the exercise that we're going through right now. It's it's in no way am I meaning to say that we just need to correct a few plays. Those plays will show up as different plays in the oncoming games. At Arizona, uh, Wildcats got the ball to start that game. Went on a nice long drive, 14 plays, but got no points. They lose a close one. On Saturday, BYU gets the ball to start the game. Long drive, no points. You lose a close one. Now, BYU got inside the Cal 35 four times, got one touchdown, one field goal. The points per possession inside the 40 went from 4.8 at Arizona to 1.8 versus Cal. That's basically your ball game, I think. 
It is. Yep. Yeah. We we've got to do a better job of uh, of getting the ball punched in um, when we when we do get into the red zone. Or as you as you said, we only started off the game moving the ball really well, and um, there were so there were there were there were opportunities, and uh, the game came down to missed opportunities, offense and defense and special teams. Kalani's already referenced multiple times how his general mindset will be to go for it on fourth down if it looks like it's a makeable situation. There was an early fourth down decision in the first drive in which they went to Bo. I think on the second straight toss sweep didn't quite make it. Fourth downs in general, are these a, a collaborative effort from multiple guys on the headset? Uh, how is that decision ultimately being made? Uh, there are, and that, that's what you'd, we would, in that area of the field, we would consider that a choice. It's a, it's a field goal opportunity, a uh, um, pretty, pretty high percentage field goal. It wasn't a chip shot by any means, but uh, for, for Skyler, we feel like that's a very makeable field goal. And uh, the decision was deliberately made. Um, feeling like that we have the uh, the ability here, we have the advantage, we can get uh, three yards in two plays or four yards in two plays, whatever the situation might have been. Um, but but yeah, that that's a that's the head coach's decision. The collaboration is really about um, does the offense feel a readiness to get the necessary yardage, and uh, and then from the special teams coordinator standpoint is is do we feel a readiness to make the field goal? And and still, even with all those, uh, you know, if the offensive coordinator and the and the special teams coordinator feel good, it still comes down to the head coach's feel of for the game. BYU's had 24 offensive possessions in two games, and more than half have ended up in opponent territory. And in those 13 drives on the other half of the field, it's been five touchdowns, a field goal, uh, three turnovers on downs, two punts between the 40 and 50, a pick, and then an end of half. So really kind of a mixed bag in terms of what you get. But you are, again, for the most part, moving the ball to a place where you feel you should be getting points. Yes, and I, and I know our our offensive uh, staff sees things exactly as you just described them. Is that we're we're creating opportunities, we have faith in our guys, and uh, the, you know the the most common uh, theme that I heard from coaches here over the last uh, 24 hours or so as we've started to get together, watch this video, talk about the game, is so uh, we've we've got to coach better, and players always mm-hmm. need to play better, and they understand that, and uh, we need we need to. Um, encourage them to do that. Make sure we've got the right guys on the field in the right situations. But we, you know, that in in the end, we really felt like we had a good enough team to to win and be two and zero, and we're not. And uh, we we take that on ourselves. Coaches may feel that, yet uh, I think players would also acknowledge they need to make the plays that are there to be made. Where there were no drops, for example, in Tucson that I can recall, there were multiple drops Saturday night. Let's say, there, yeah, there were, yeah, and I know our players uh, feel the same way, and and that's the mark of a team that's still in it. Um, you know, I think you'll always get coach speak and player speak, but uh, there, you know, I, I think coaches and players know when uh, when a team has kind of doesn't have belief in uh, whether it's the other side of the ball or whether it's the guys playing next to them on the field. And our team, our team's not there in any way. In fact, um, you know, typically after a game and after a loss, the the head coach uh, addresses the team, and those are really important words. It's a uh, it's a time to um, share with the team. Um, the, the outcome of the game and how the head coach sees it, but also plant the seeds uh, for the preparation next week. And actually, the players took took that meeting over, and and, uh, and Kalani recognizing that. So that's that's, ex- that's really exactly what I would say, and offer to offer just kind of a quick blessing on those who might be uh, injured and coming back next week and all that. And the visiting team safe travels home, and and he really kept his words limited. And I and I thought the team really was uh, behind itself there in those moments. So without betraying the coach, player, player, coach confidence that uh, is kind of uh, um, you know personal to the locker room, what would you say the general theme was when players began to take over a little bit there? Well, they they put it on themselves, you know, and there was not um, you know the the game was uh, such that uh, you know I think any anyone can say well geez this is a lot like uh, last year you know the, the defense went out and, and played really hard and 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 gave us a chance to win you know for whatever that means but. Uh, defensively, we, I, I think there's a there's a general recognition a recognition that we played a team whose strength was defense. That was Cal, and um, and we felt like we needed to play better defense than the opponent, and we did not do that as a defense mm. on that day, and uh, and we gave up big plays to the point where um, you know that, that that with the blown coverages and didn't create enough pass rush on another uh, another play that just took too long. I mean, those are plays that we feel like we should have in the bag, and so. We felt like that we should have um, held them to a lower scoring 
output. And uh, that's what we heard from the players is just everybody taking accountability, offense, defense, and special teams. Let's get this right with confidence in each other, confidence in our coaches. Let's go. Over the last 10-plus years of BYU football, a lot's been said about the 24-point plateau offensively and defensively, and for good reason. It's a, it's a benchmark that has kind of stood the test of time. And in the first two games, you've allowed 23 and 21. So you're within that benchmark, and the results yet are 1-1. Are, are one and one. It seems to me that in the last few years, the margin for errors narrowed a bit to where uh, more is required of the offense as the defense is generally, generally speaking, keeping it where it needs to be. Yeah, I, I think um, I really like that uh, that break point of 24 points on offense and defense when we're talking about um, statistical analysis and maybe maybe for coaches. But the, the problem is when, when we try to equate it to um, reasons for winning and losing, Winning defense is winning the score. Winning offense is winning the score. Whatever it takes. That's right. And we're going to win some games uh, 40-something to 40-something, and that's, that doesn't particularly sit well with me because I spend so much time with the defensive guys. But uh, that's a win, and defensive guys are smiling after when you win 40-something to 40-something or 50-something to 50-something. I was a player here in, in the days where we won some of those 50-something to 50-something games. And, um, and, and winning, winning effort is allowing less points than your opponent on defense. It is break time on the Coordinator's Corner. When we come back, more from Special Teams Coordinator and Assistant Head Coach Ed Lamb. We'll get more into BYU's Special Teams performance after this. Later in the half hour, your questions for the coaches and the coach Ed Lamb here using hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. We're back with more right after this. Call it a path. Or a way through. It can be arrow straight or have twists and turns. It's life's financial journey, and Mountain America Credit Union is here to guide you every step of the way. With timely advice and affordable products, this is your journey. Let's begin together. We're Mountain America, guiding you forward. Blue runs deep on BYU TV. Don't miss the BYU-Utah women's volleyball game Thursday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar sports. Bruh, I ain't got no chill. The BYU TV sports post game, BYU at Wisconsin. Saturday after the game. Some say if you're looking for the soul of America, you'll find it right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But if Memphis is the soul of America, then what's the soul of Memphis? From the banks of the Mississippi to the neon lights of Beale Street, that soul's hiding somewhere, and I've got to put it all in one painting. Join me as we paint the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Don't miss Painting the Town tomorrow at 830 Mountain on BYU TV. Awesome. He's super nice, uh, really personable. I don't feel right now in one word, overjoyed. At Bailey'sAlly.com. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it. In Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. BYU now 1-1 one one after back-to-back -back games against Pac-12 opponents, so win against Arizona, lost to Cal. BYU headed to Wisconsin this week, visiting with special teams coordinator Ed Lamb. Defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki coming up in the next half hour. Let's get two special teams. Skyler Southam uh, made his two scoring kicks on Saturday. He's now yet to miss a field goal or a PAT try. He had one of each on Saturday, including his first BYU field goal, 36-yarder. And again, the BYU was in parts of the field, Ed, where long field goals might have been considerations, but we'll see his leg at some point. 
Um, yes, absolutely. Big for him to make his first kick, um, his first field goal attempt of uh, his career. And uh, yeah, was, as we talked about earlier, had some had some chances maybe to go for some other ones. And uh, just, you know, it, it felt like the right call at that time as a team was to go for it. Andrew Mickelson is your kickoff guy and was uh, getting them deep and directional, uh, really. I, I, did you feel the way that he executes them is uh, it, for, for a kickoff guy to not put it in the end zone, but put it near the pylon and pin somebody and he does pretty well? He, he sure does, yeah, and that's that's what we uh, that's what we attempt to do. I think they had one return out to the 26-yard line, so overall, um, you know, we gave up one yard on on that one, but uh, got uh, two others uh, significantly inside the 25, and so it was a, a big a big help the way he puts it up in the air like that. We uh, you know we also drew a penalty on on one of those as well, and we were able to pin him on the 11-yard line. So really love what Andrew does, and and he does have the ability to uh, line drive it out and put it in touchbacks. And there will be times where we use that a little more this mm-hmm. year. Uh, through two weeks, uh, kick cover, thumbs up then? Um, yes, yeah, so far it's been effective. I think we can be better. Um, you know, I think, I think you know, we, we, we want to be a team, if we're going to be kicking it near the field of play and allowing teams to return it, we want to be a team that more often will create field position where the opponent's starting around their 15-yard line. Okay. Uh, as for the onside kick late, you go to Skyler South, and for that I presume he's the designated or trained uh, onside guy. What did you think of the attempt? Um, the, uh, it, it just didn't get the right, uh, ang- the, the thing that he uh, probably would want to take back the most is the angle that was angling to go, uh, out of bounds on the sideline at about 20 or 21 yards. And it should be more like 14 or 15 yards. And so the angle was uh, too steep and kicked directly at uh, the opponent. And then, um, it, it was a little too hot as well. So it, it happened to take a cherry hop and the, and the guy fielded it. Uh, for Cal, fielded it well, but uh, if it's, we need it to, to roll a little bit slower, create a little more indecision, and be a little wider. In, in your special teams period, clearly something that gets worked on is onside. Uh, do both Andrew and Skyler have that, uh, or is he kind of your guy for that? Oh, they, they do. And, and there's, um, you know, with an onside kick, it's a the, an oblong ball. There's no way to scientifically <laughs> strike that thing to make sure that it always hops at, at the right time. Even, even NFL kickers, you know, they, you get some onside kicks that look... You know, they just they just go right to the opponent. It's not the highest percentage result in the world. <laughs> That's right. To be, to be fair, yeah, if, if we had, uh, yeah, if it was high percentage, everybody would do it because yeah. the risk reward is so so big on that, right? To get the ball back, but no, it uh, it's something that we practice hard. We want to execute well, and uh, and the the biggest wasn't wasn't necessarily how it bounced. It's just the angle that what we needed to improve there. Diane Gomoloku recovers a, mu- uh, a a muffed punt or a punt muff at the 16. Sadly, no points on the ensuing offensive possession for BYU, and that was pretty big. But uh, whether defensively or on special teams, Diane's a guy you trust a lot, put him in a lot of important positions, and he makes plays for you. He does, and he understands the importance of that. Uh, you know, With his snap count on defense the last two years, Multiple times I've approached him in during games and said, "Hey, I think I think we can take a few snaps off of you on special teams. We have capable backups, and we need you. We need you to be ready to go on defense." And uh, he absolutely will not do it. And, mm. and you know, if I if I were to say we are replacing you, that would be different. But every time that I've gone and given him the option, he feels like that's just a really critical piece of the way he plays the game, and he wants to start every defensive series with a coverage. So you have to love that about a player. Yeah, absolutely. That he yeah. won't take the option. It, it is, and it and and what he brings in that way. Braden L. is another one, and and if I start rattling them off, I'm going to leave guys off. But this is a this is a coverage team, and it has been. I mean, there, you you talk to coaches around the country when when we talk, everyone um, that is studies special teams is jealous of the guys that we have running mm. down and covering punts and kickoffs. It gets noticed. They they love it, and they they're passionate about it, and it's so many of our starting guys on offense and defense. Uh, Rhett Allman's done all your punting to this point uh, through two games. Your big Australian Danny Jones you brought in hasn't punted yet in a game. Uh, how's his progression coming along? And, and is that a week-to-week in-practice competition between those two? And, and how is his progress? Yeah, you know, Danny learning the game um, still. And, and by learning, he, he knows what to do. But just having a feel for um, the amount of, of effort uh, intensity and the balance between intensity and relaxation, that kind of stuff for him is still very much what he's learning. And, and practice can only take him so far. We'd like to get him some some reps under a little less pressure. Both of our games have been really tight um, to, up to this point, and so we haven't quite gotten him in there. I have really good confidence that when he comes in, he's going to do a great job. But but the flip side of that is, is Rhett's been doing a marvelous job. Yep. He's one of the top punters in the country right now statistically. And I think of the uh, multiple punts you've attempted now, I think nine or ten 
over the first uh, two weeks, uh, nine or only one has not been what they call, call efficient yeah. relative to net of either 38 plus or pinned inside the 20. So it's been a very efficient punt game through two games. A linebacker play, as that is your position, uh, Butch Pau uh, forced a fumble that uh, Diane then scooped and scored. That was a big play at the time. That's what Butch brings is his physicality. He does not flinch at the point of contact, and uh, and that, that runner was completely caught off guard. I think it was Zane who kind of spun him around, and, and before the runner could get his vision back up field, uh, Butch hit him, and Diane doing what, what he does was just Johnny on the spot and scooped it up. I mean, I, it was... I had to really watch the the video to to figure out what happened. It was almost like an interception return for a touchdown. In fact, people keep saying that around the office. Oh, Diane's interception return. No, it was actually a fumble. Yeah, it, yeah. Was a, it was a fumble. It just happened very quickly. It was about as smooth of a fumble recovery as you can make. A very instantaneous scoop and score. And by the way, all three tackles for loss BYU recorded came from linebackers Saturday night. Sione Taki Taki with two, and Zane Anderson uh, with one. It is break time. Coming up next, your questions on social media for Coach Ed Lamb. Use the hashtag CCBYU you on Twitter or comments on the BYU Football Facebook Live page. This is the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. We're back after this. AAA agents like Leticia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance, like when it comes time to buy a car. So how can I help you today? What if I decide to become a rideshare driver? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. Man, this car is amazing. Look at that touchscreen. How about that confidence? Look how she handles those groceries. Positively effortless. The teenager is borrowing the car. This could get rough, but no, that's a reliable car and a win for mom. So you mentioned you want to finance with Deseret First Credit Union? Definitely. Mom's dream car is as close as Deseret First Credit Union. That's right. Get pre-approved online today or talk to your dealer. Your dreams at Deseret First Credit Union. That's right. A foundling hospital. A vow of friendship. A ruthless matron. You must be safe! And a self-willed girl with plans of her own. Don't miss the next episode of Heady Feather, Sunday at 6 Mountain on BYU TV. This September, see the good in the world with exciting shows on BYU TV. Get ready to laugh because Studio C is on every Monday at 7 Mountain with all your favorite characters and hilarious antics. Come along with Todd Hansen as he discovers all new stories on all new episodes of The Story Trek, Tuesdays at 8 Mountain. It's a new season of Relative Race with more puzzles, relatives, and surprises along the way. Sundays at 7 Mountain. There's something for everyone here on BYU TV. On Monday, September 17th, watch the BYU Women's Soccer Match live in HD on our digital platform. Join the game using the BYU TV app or by going to BYUtv.org. See you there. And you are in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Greg Rubel visiting with BYU's special teams coordinator, linebackers coach, and assistant head coach, Ed Lamb. And it's a trip to Madison this week for the Cougars. Uh, a bit of a thumbnail, Coach Lamb, on, on Wisconsin and what to expect. And from your perspective as linebackers coach, um, so much focuses on Jonathan Taylor, leads the nation in rushing yards right now by a wide margin. He's averaging more than seven yards per carry. You saw him up close last year and saw as a freshman how good he could be. He's improved as a sophomore and is truly a Heisman shortlister right now. He's, he's amazing. It's been fun to watch him, and we're, we're just in the early stages right now. Some of our uh, uh, administrative staff has really uh, – they get, they're about 10 days ahead normally uh, from what we are in terms of looking at the next opponent. And so they've, they've watched him the most. We, we put a few hours in this morning and uh, need to get back to it uh, over the next 24 hours really will be uh, emphasis on our plan, what we do against them. But uh, the, way he, the way that, number one – uh, schematically, they just uh, they are prepared to win ugly. And if if you stop the run against Wisconsin, their answer is not okay. I guess we need to pass. It's oh okay, game on. Now we're going to run it even more. And so we're uh, we're really excited for that challenge and just to see how our guys respond to that. And uh, from a defensive standpoint, it's it's everything that uh, everything you could ask for as a coach is an opportunity for you guys to step up and play. You know the the old fashioned game of tackle football. Case in point, to your point, at Saturday's game, I believe is seventeen ten Wisconsin leading New Mexico second half, 
And they go, well, just keep doing what we do. And they end up with a big win and 400-plus rushing yards, and Taylor ends up doing what he does. They'll stick with the game plan until it gets them what they want. It, very much. And it's a great it's a great time for us to be studying that and watching it. We, you know, if, if we are going to have our strength as a team be what, what we think it is and what it was in game one, we have to be prepared to be very comfortable in a tight game and continue to, you know, nowadays a lot of people call it winning ugly. That's just, you know, it, it, there's there's a lot of teams that win 42 to 38 and the fans are just ecstatic about offense, defense, and special teams. And then there's other teams that are winning 16 to 13 and, and you know, people are complaining that uh, that the offense isn't very dynamic, but but those are wins too. And, uh, the, you know, that may, be, that may be where our team's strike zone is, as close to that as, as being able to run the football and insist on running the football, kicking field goals or going forward on fourth down, but being successful at either when we do. Well, relative to that note, uh, more than about half of BYU's games since Kalani's been on board have been touchdown games, seven points or fewer. Uh, he's coached 28 games. 13 of the 28 have been decided by seven points or fewer. Those are the kinds of games BYU finds itself in more often than not. A question coming in from social media for Coach Ed Lamb. It's uh, at N8Ricks on uh, CC, hashtag CCBYU. And the question is, uh, do you trust your field goal kicker, Skylar South, and we presume, to make a kick over 45 yards? Yeah, I think we've we've talked about that several times uh, today, earlier, and and uh, on other shows. He's uh, his range is definitely anywhere inside fifty. Feel very good about his ability to make those kicks, and we're uh, we're green lighting as far as the decision goes. Once we hit the thirty five yard line, really inside the forty is range, and inside the thirty five, we feel like his percentage is really high. And I mentioned before the break that uh, of the tackles for loss that BYU had on Saturday, all three came from linebackers Sione and Zane Anderson. Sione also had a pass breakup and a hurry. Uh, through two games, I, is it fair to say that, that you're getting out of Sione what you hoped you'd get in the position switch from D-line to, to outside linebacker? Yes, and and I'll, a caveat to that is there's always room for improvement. I think um, you know one of one of Sione's uh, greatest talents is the passion that he plays with and the energy effort that he brings to the game. And I need to continue to, to channel that uh, so that he is involved in even more plays. I think there, there at times he we got caught in the wrong position on uh, Saturday, and and that was a game with a low margin for error from a defensive standpoint. And so we have to be play as well as we can play. And I I don't think he's reached his uh, his top end yet. Okay, uh, more social media from at Blue Diener 22 And we did allude to this earlier in the show, but the question maybe for a little more depth on this, uh, please ask Ed Lamb what the decision-making process is like when deciding to go forward on fourth down or kick a field goal or, or try to pin deep with a punt. What are the kind of factors you're going to be examining, uh, generally speaking? Yeah, I, figure, I feel like some of these questions came in before we talked about it already. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, so the first is that the, the special teams coordinator, this is, this is not just BYU, but uh, pretty much on every team, the special teams coordinator will will typically call out when we when we're in four down territory which means we're uh, we're a little too far out to punt and uh we're we're a little too um we're a little too close into the end zone to punt and a little too far out to uh, to have a high percentage field goal. And then and then that may change a, a play later with a, with a couple of yards gained. And then and then the special teams coordinator will notify the head coach and offensive coordinator that we're in the high red zone or field goal range. And um, and then at that point, it's uh, the discussion more is shifting to the offensive coordinator and the head coach. And um, you know that that's why analytics don't work in football. By the way, is because it, th- there's no way for an analytic book to go through. Well, what if their what if their left corner is injured? What if their nose guard is not very good? What if our right guard is not playing to his potential? And so there's the offensive coordinator and the head coach have a feel, and they decide whether to go forward or kick a field goal. Something I've found about analytics over the years is that uh, many of the deep dive stats are excellent in terms of assessing, after the fact, trends and win-loss correlations. In-game, they're less uh, maybe utilized because those aren't the kind of things you turn to a book and say this is a lot of things are situational and you can see after the after the fact the effect but in game is a very different animal. Yeah, you're describing and our, our stats professors would say that that you can effectively mine the noise. In other words, you can throw anything into a statistical analysis and the after the fact occurrence there's going to be patterns that show up. But but the reality is those patterns are showing up because coaches are making decisions based on much more criteria than you could put in an, anal, in an uh, analytic. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, through two games, uh, four defensive pass interference calls, which matches the ent- the total for 13 games last year. That is an anomaly to have four PIs in 13 games to go to four in two. But what are my, maybe so the, the below-the-surface reasons that might be occurring this year where it wasn't occurring last year? Um, well, number one is I think we have um, – uh, 
an, an uptick in the confidence and co- and competitiveness of our corners. And uh, and then number two is uh, our our coaching staff. We're behind right now in in channeling that competitiveness and that desire to play well um, into actually playing playing the ball. And so we haven't we haven't been able to get that done. Uh, to this point, our coverage is tighter. Our coverage is more aggressive. Our defensive, uh, our calls are more aggressive. We are challenging wide receivers. It's showing up in the statistics. And uh, you know, Arizona, we had three pass interference calls, I believe, but no completions deep. And and neither one of those are the sweet spot. We need to be able to um, compete, intercept the ball, turn and play the ball, and that's when our our pass interference calls will go down. But uh, in no way do we want to start playing uh, soft, soft level defense and having our corners be afraid to uh, stick tight and challenge at the line of scrimmage. Right now, they're challenging at the line of scrimmage, and then when they get down the field, they just don't. We don't have habitized yet the ability to look back and play the ball how it needs to be played. Okay, finally, Coach Lamb, the Madison mentality going into Camp Randall and playing one of the best teams in the country. What might it be? Um, well. Uh, the, their their theme, um, Wisconsin's theme, runs throughout their team of, of tough physical football. They play that way on offense. They play that way on defense. They play that way on special teams. They're also um, uh, fairly predictable about what they do because that's how physical f- uh, football teams are. They're not um, they're not trying to out scheme out gimmick. They have they have their what we call protectors. They're not going to always do the same thing out of the same formation, but uh, and they, so they change it up enough. But the biggest challenge for our guys going into this game is how well we can execute and how physical that we can play. And I feel great about our our opportunity to match up right now. I feel very excited about it. All right, Coach Lamb, thanks. I always enjoy the way you things uh, the way you break things down, and we'll we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. All right, that is Coach Ed Lamb. Coming up after the break, we'll visit with BYU's defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki. This is the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. When my grandfather started this company in 1947, he couldn't have envisioned what we would ultimately become. We realized that our value to our customers is that we will be there day after day, year after year, doing whatever we need to to find solutions to the challenges that they face. We are committed to be honestly better in all that we do, in every opportunity that we have to serve our customers. Discover something new this week with BYU TV. Tonight at 7 Mountain, it's finally here. The Season 9 series premiere of Studio C. More laughs and fun than ever before. It's a night you won't want to miss with the family. Then, Eric Dowdle is an amazing artist that adds true character to his paintings. It's the Season 3 premiere of Painting the Town. Tomorrow at 8.30 Mountain. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. A vow of friendship. A ruthless matron. Do what we say! And a self-willed girl with plans of her own. Don't miss the next episode of Heady Feather, Sunday at 6 Mountain on BYU TV. Hi there, how are you? My name's Todd. Nice to meet you. Any lesson can be learned from the story track. I felt misunderstood. I felt like there was no one in the world who was going through that thing. I hope people will understand that they're special. I'm a believer. They're important. I'm a believer. I got right there saved my life. They have a compelling story. They are worth getting to know. Watch the story track tomorrow at 8 Mountain on BYU TV. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. Second half hour of the Coordinator's Corner underway now with defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki in studio. You can ask the coach question using hashtag CCBYU or via comments on the BYU Football Facebook Live broadcast of our show. Coach Tuiaki in the uh, home loss to Cal on Saturday, another game allowing fewer than 24 points. Arizona scored 23, Cal scores 21. Uh, used to be that benchmark was pretty lock solid. Uh, these days, it's getting harder to make that number hold up every week. But defensively speaking, generally through two games, how do you like your group and the points allowed generally? 
uh, yeah, you know, not not bad. There was uh, obviously when we look at film, um, I th- think that we gave up one cheap one. Um, the other two scores, we we felt like we made them earn it. Was the cheap one the Noah pass down the sideline? Yeah, number nine. Yeah, yep, and that's you know, I think that that's more on coaching than it is anything else. Um, you know, as we're scheming sometimes and just trying to put kids in, in position to make plays and stuff sometimes it's just more important just to make sure that they know what they're doing and we're all on the same page and everybody's speaking the same language and communicating and that was just the uh, you know it's just the blown coverage and and maybe putting too much on a kid but i think that's more more on us as coaches than anything else but other than that i thought you know they put play pretty stout wasn't was not you know too pumped up about the run defense um, they did a really good job, you know, scheming. We, we, we didn't think that we'd see uh, their quarterback number five as much as we did. But I think uh, for the way that the game was going and uh, what they were trying to do as far as control the run game, and, and uh, I mean, they were up and they just they just did a good job playing keep away the whole time. I thought that, that, was, that was well played by them. But, you know, we needed to be stout against the run in order to get the ball back more for our offense. The Arizona game, so much focus on one guy, uh, Khalil Tate and his strengths, and it was really well played by BYU. Cal, first of all, gave you a different starting quarterback. They didn't play Ross Bowers at all, who's a 3,000-yard passing guy from last year. So they go to seven, uh, who's Garbers, who can run around a little bit, but then McIlwain, who's kind of their change of pace guy, played a ton, as you referenced. How much of what they did at quarterback relative to quarterback mobility was uh, a difference maker the way you saw it? Compared to, say, Tate, how you played him. Yeah, you know, it it was – I I just thought that, you know – they uh, they did a really good job just holding on to the ball with him, you know, and I think it would have been a, a different story if we were playing from up um, or if the game was uh, a, a little bit closer. But they, they, they just – they knew that they had the lead. They knew that they if they could control the ball and, and try to just nickel and dime us in the run game, especially with the quarterback run game. There's sometimes in some of the coverages we were down a guy and and uh, we needed the D-line to show up, which, uh, you know, we, we didn't do as good of a job. Uh, in this game, but uh, you know, it, it was just just good game plan by them switching to it. We ended up switching to to a different uh, uh, run defense. And, and, you know, when we started to feel like we were playing a little bit more four four minute offense, um, you know, it was got the ball back a couple times, but uh, just just wasn't wasn't uh, good enough for us to get the ball back enough times. BYU was actually plus one in the margin on Saturday with three takeaways, and you like your chances. In fact, it's the first time that BYU, since Kalani's been here, first time that BYU's lost a home game when being plus in the turnover margin, and BYU was plus one on Saturday. There are different ways to create havoc beyond, beyond, beyond sacks. BYU has one sack in two games. There are TFLs, and there have been PBUs, and there have been picks and a scoop and score. And so uh, BYU is making defensive plays, but does the one sack through two games number, uh, did you think you'd have more than that through two, or does it really matter if it's situational? How do you see that one sack number right now? Yeah, you know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't think that we'd get any in the first game just because of the game plan, but this one I thought that we'd have more. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it's just really some technical stuff that we've got to get better at. Um, we gotta we gotta continue to stay active with the D line and and uh, we had I think we had opportunities you know I think we had opportunities the the touchdown pass um, you know to the running back straight down the middle I thought that the quarterback was holding on to the ball too long mm. um, and then you know there's just there were just opportunities the fourth the fourth down was one that um, you know we've we've harped on as far as just the ways that we're gonna play certain things the D line and we didn't and so we've we just got to get better we got sh- we got to get sharper in the way that we're playing certain things and. And making sure that uh, I'm coaching it the right way, as far as the kids understanding what's expected of them. Relative to your position, defensive line, uh, who's been standing out through uh, two games to you? you know, the 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 D tackles I thought have been doing a really you know we've uh, we mentioned it before we've we've got six guys that we think we can rotate through in the D tackle spot. Um, we went later on and started playing uh, four D tackles to try to stop the run there. Um, but those those guys have been doing a really good job. You know, Kyrus has always stuck out. The Bracken has been a really bright spot in the defensive line. Um, Earl's made plays. Earl's made plays. Uh, Zach Dawes has been really, really good for us, and and uh, you know so has Lorenzo Fautel as well as as well as Matthew's been reliable. Um, but uh, you know we just got we just got to keep plugging away with uh, with who we've got. I, I I love love the group. I think that we've got a good team. Um, we just have to keep keep uh, tightening things down to play better run defense. At defensive end, week. I think uh, Devin got in and made a play. Uh, Kofusi for you on Saturday as well. Yeah, he's seen some time. Yeah, so he he see, he's he's he and. Uh, uh, Uriah Leotel are getting more snaps than they did previously, um, and we took a couple snaps off of off of Trajan as well as Corbin, 
um, and putting the D tackles in and everybody and, and everything. But uh, yeah, the, the, he's you know Devin's coming along. Devin's doing a good job as well as Uriah. In our post game conversation with Kalani, uh, he mentioned uh, how how even though the defense was making plays at times on Saturday, it was tougher to, for them to get off the field consistently. Defensive third down number right now is 46.7% of opponents converting on thirds. How do you see BYU on third right now, and what might help that number come down, hopefully, over time? Yeah, we, we've got to get better, for sure. We talked about that as, as being one of the one of the things this week that just wasn't as good, our third down defense. Um, you know, get the, the biggest thing... I think all that's leading up to it is we've got to put them in third and long, and we've got to we've got to get a pass rush in third and long. And so, um, I thought that they did a really good job staying in third and shorts, you know, and and they did a really good job just kind of controlling it. But when we get into third and longs, we've got to be able to rush the passer, but we've got to be able to stop the run on first and second again in third and long. Were you surprised at all that you didn't see quarterback number three? Uh, or no, you, I, were you kind of ready for anything with that? Yeah, with that? The, because the, they were the, using three. Yeah, the one the one thing that did surprise me was just how much they used number five. I didn't, you know, I don't think that if the game was was, uh, I think if the the score was tied or if we were up, I don't think we would have saw number five at all. Um, but I thought that he was just basically a game plan for them, you know, being up and trying to control more and being a little bit better of a runner and, you know, obviously and. Con- uh, quarterback run game, you're going to gain one more guy, and and they did a good job with that. And so I thought that we saw him more than than we expected, as well as some of the schematical things that they were doing, which was really good in uh, using him to run. Before we head to break, uh, Ed Lamb referenced near the top of his half hour how post game, uh, Kalani said a little bit or some things, but he thought that uh, the players kind of took over a little bit themselves in, in in that post game. Can you give us your sense of 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 what kind of ownership was taken Saturday post game and how you felt about that? Yeah, you know, uh, Tristan Tristan Hodge got up and spoke to the team and really passionate and fired up just about sticking together and being better and doing things the right way during the week and and uh, you know uh, speaking more for himself and the offense than anything else, but just as far as um, the 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 unity that they have and just keeping it together. I uh, feel like we have a good thing going and one loss can't tear us apart. We've just got to continue to push the right way. All right. It is break time on the coordinator's corner. When we return, defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki on the play of his young secondary. And we take a look ahead to the Wisconsin Badgers and BYU's upcoming trip to Madison. We're back with that right after this. AAA agents like Rich are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance, like at an open house. So what questions do you have for me? Do we have to have insurance before we even buy the house? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. Tomorrow on BYU Football with Kalani Sitake, the coach recaps the Cal game, previews the matchup with Wisconsin, and answers your questions using the hashtag Sitake Show. Watch BYU Football with Kalani Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. This September, see the good in the world with exciting shows on BYU TV. Get ready to laugh because Studio C is on every Monday at 7 Mountain with all your favorite characters and hilarious antics. Come along with Todd Hansen as he discovers all new stories on all new episodes of The Story Trek, Tuesdays at 8 Mountain. It's a new season of Relative Race with more puzzles, relatives, and surprises along the way. Sundays at 7 Mountain. There's something for everyone here on BYU TV. Some say if you're looking for the soul of America, you'll find it right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But if Memphis is the soul of America, then what's the soul of Memphis? From the banks of the Mississippi to the neon lights of Beale Street, that soul's hiding somewhere, and I've got to put it all in one painting. Join me as we paint the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Don't miss Painting the Town tomorrow at 830 Mountain on BYU TV. Viewers can get involved by going to randomaxtv.com and nominating either people who need help in their lives or people who are a force of good in their community and just need a step up or something like that or the recognition that they are a good person. Sometimes that's all you really need is that recognition that you're a good person. You're a good person. Sorry, I just wanted to give you that recognition. Don't miss Random Acts tomorrow at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. The Coordinator's Corner is brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys, BYU defensive coordinator and defensive line coach, Elisa Tuiaki, with me until the top of the hour. 
And uh, we talked about the defensive line a little bit uh, last segment. We had Ed Lamb talking linebackers in the first half hour. The secondary, uh, I think there was a point in the game Saturday where I think we saw a couple of redshirt freshmen manning the corners for you. And uh, you've played a lot of corners here through the first couple of games, including young guys you clearly trust already. Yeah, th- those young guys are doing a really good job with their development, and uh, Coach uh, Coach Guilford is doing a really good job with them. But their uh, yeah, no, their their contributions huge for us to be able to get them now, um, get the, get get them into the game and get them developing, as well as just kind of taking lumps a little bit as they as they learn and grow. But uh, th- I think that's going to be a bright right part of this defense in the future i won't bring this up too much more but it was kind of curious that last year <coughs> through 13 games the entire season byu had four defensive pis for the year and byu is already sitting at four defensive pis through two games coach lamb gave us his perspective on why that might be last year to this year his his thoughts what do you think about how uh, the pis have come where they've come why they've come and why you went from so few to a few more this year yeah you know um i think i think one of them's attributed to youth you know, and, and I think the other one is just playing as much man as we do and uh, the expectation on just leaving those guys out there and, and having them play and, um, you know, as the, the game goes and a young guy gets in and expect him to play with technique and all that stuff. I and mean, some of those guys done a really good job, um, tested deep, and some of them was just, you know, giving up a couple PIs. And so, you know, as a, as a coordinator, I think as a defense, we don't like to sit there and, and, and uh, you know, it, obviously it's important that we change that, but I think it's just more focusing on, hey, we got to be better with our technique, got to be better with our technique instead of talking about, hey, don't, don't do this, don't do that. It's just like, no, you're there, you're fast enough, you're athletic enough, you're long enough, and you're, you're good. We just got to continue to play this way, and you'll be you'll be in a better spot. Now, BYU did have five PBUs on Saturday. Interestingly, four of the five come from your guys, defensive linemen. So, no matter how a pass gets broken up, it's the fact that it gets broken up is the important thing. And you've got active D linemen with four pass breakups on Saturday night. Yeah, that that's been one. Th- you know, we we changed a lot of a lot of things that we did up front this off season. Uh, went and did some professional development and trying to do some things. And you know, right now I think we're right in the thick in the middle of the ugly stage where. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, Kalani and I have both both seen uh, success in other defenses and other ways that we've played. Really feel like just sticking with the ugly phase right now with, with what we're doing and what we're asking the kids to do. They we're going to get more disruption, and we just have to see that sack number go up, and I think it will as we continue to just uh, stick with what we're doing and, and uh, working through all the kinks. Like Ed said, there's almost no such thing as winning ugly because the first word's more important than the second. The ugly part doesn't matter as much as the winning part. Win's a win. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. However, absolutely. however it takes to get it done. Scoop and score from uh, Diane Gomoliku. Uh, he recovered a, a, a punt muff later in the game, and then he has the scoop and score to make it feel like a whole new ball game at the time. Uh, what best describes uh, Diane's impact on this team? He's he's such a great kid. He's a, great, he's a really good player. Um, you know, active. He actually, what was it? Uh, I think it was you know two three plays before that is when he is when we ended up blowing a coverage and they and gave up that big play and then came back immediately and and he uh, you know Butch stuck the guy and he was there to pick it up you know on the beat and and run it in and then. You know, later on, ends up getting the getting the recovery on the on special teams. So, he, I mean, it's been been great to see him play through through some of those. And it's always important for corners and safeties to just forget when you get beat, and have a short term memory, um, because he's he's a really good player for us. And we don't want to, you know, harp on all those things that he ends up doing wrong. As he does so much right for us. What did he see when he jumped on the sideline uh, and let nine go there? What, what what was he seeing, or how, why did that play it, happen? It, it was it was more on just the communication as far as what we so. You know, one one of the rules um, that we we talk about as a defensive staff, and for the last two years, we we don't ever install anything on Thursday, um, and this week we did, mm. right? And we were kind of talking about, well, you know, don't like to do that, don't like to put that on the players. It, it felt like it wasn't that big of a deal, um, but you know, maybe just superstitious, but it was a big deal. And, and so that was a new installation component that led to that. You say? I I think it was, yeah, mm. and that's why I say it's just on the on the coaches, you know, mm. on, on us, on me. Um, on just making sure, you know, it, there, there's more to be said about a, a player knowing what he's doing and being where he needs to be. And if they beat us, then, hey, they did a good job. They, they threw a good ball and completed it. But to just blow, blow the top off of the coverage because of uh, a mental error or communication, I think that's just, that's just uh, we, we can't do that. Fact is, he stayed in the game, made big plays for you thereafter, and as you said, a great kid. And uh, as Coach Lamb told us in the first half hour of the show, because he is so relied upon as a, as a defensive starter at safety, um, Ed says there are times when I want to maybe take a couple snaps off his game and say, you know, maybe special teams you don't, you know, 
And he said, I, I, he, he doesn't want to take a special teams playoff either. And so there he is making plays. Yeah, yeah. I, I, re, I remember uh, last year when, when Ed was getting ready to take him off, and he was – I mean, he was looking like he, he looked like he was going to come up and punch it. He was just like, "No, you're not going to take me off kick." I see he takes so much pride in in special teams and playing, and feels like that's a big part of who he is and what he does. And and uh, I commend him for it. That's it's really cool to see that. Okay, it's early in the week. It's a Monday. You're not so deep. You're not so deep into Wisconsin yet. Others on the staff may be. Uh, what are some things that uh, you'd initially share with our audience about uh, Wisconsin, the top ten team playing at home, the team that you saw at your place uh, here last year at Lavelle Edwards Stadium? They're good. They they're good. Just like they were last year, uh, very, very committed to the run. Um, and I think that's that's a big deal for us this week. We have to stop this guy. I mean, the, the running back is unbelievable. I think he's a really good player. Uh, I mean, I think they returned like seven or eight offensive linemen. The entire um, group's back, basically. The entire yeah. group's back yeah. and, and how they rotate it through. And they've got, you know, they lost the Fumagalli tight end to the NFL, but they bring in, they bring in a, a freshman kid that's, I think, just as good catching the ball, not as good blocking. But they, I mean, they'll always carry four or five tight ends I can block and so they're they're good they're really good we have I mean it's a it's a definitely a challenge for us this week to stop the run um these guys as you watch film and you start packing the box and you and you're and you're saying okay we're going to stop the run they're almost challenged to they're, they're not going to say okay let's abound in the run they're starting to do this they're saying you want to stop the run we're going to run it even more and so um, I think it's going to be a fun challenge for us this week. All right. Heading to break on the Coordinator's Corner. When we return, your social media questions using hashtag CCBYU. If you have a question for Elisha Tuiaki, fire it our way. Hashtag CCBYU on Twitter as we continue live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. Back after this. The BYU Sports Nation guys check out the BYU store. Hey, before you hit someone with that football, take a look around at all the great BYU gear from Nike. Hoodies, exercise wear, sweaters, t-shirts, all the stuff an active sportscaster needs. Um, Spencer, that one is actually for your better half. No, not Jerem, your wife. The BYU Store, keeping Jerem and Spencer looking great and proud to sponsor BYU Sports Nation on BYU TV and BYU Radio. I ain't got no chill. BYU TV Sports Countdown to Kickoff. BYU at Wisconsin. 2.30 Eastern, 12.30 Mountain. Saturday on BYU TV. I'm Dave McCann. Tomorrow on After Further Review, we look back at Cal and we look ahead to Wisconsin. It's the best hour of BYU football on TV. Blaine Fowler, David Nixon, and Brian Logan explain the game tomorrow night here on BYU TV. Can you get started with some education? Charity! Charity! To make tough best, lobster best. Delish! Delish! <laughs> <laughs> Viewers can get involved by going to randomaxtv.com and nominating either people who need help in their lives or people who are a force of good in their community and just need a step up or something like that or the recognition that they are a good person. Sometimes you, that's all you really need is that recognition that you're a good person. You're a good person. Sorry, I just wanted to give you that recognition. Don't miss Random Acts tomorrow at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. of the game at JCW's includes something for everybody from burgers to wings shakes to salads JCW's quality and a lot of it Le in Lehigh American Fork Provo South Jordan and coming soon to Harriman defensive coordinator defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki with me on the coordinator's corner BYU at Wisconsin this coming Saturday 1 30 p.m. mountain time kick 11 30 a.m. mountain time for the pregame on the radio with a 12 30 pregame on BYU TV before the break you referenced Jonathan Taylor Wisconsin's fine running back tremendous freshman year ran for almost 2,000 yards as a rookie and now through two games he averages 199 rush yards per game leads the country by a wide mar wide margin over number two he's got five rushing scores and he's averaging 7.8 yards per carry and that's on a lot of carries he averages about 25 26 carries per game so it's high volume and high yardage he's a great combination of everything anybody would want in a running back 
Yeah, I, I think he's a real deal. I think he's he's such a good player. He's only a, he's a true sophomore. Yeah. I mean, that's unbelievable. He was good last year, but uh, you can tell that uh, the maturity, being in a, being in off season with with their team and everything, I mean, he's just so much stronger, athletic, and just you have to gang tackle him. Okay, uh, philosophical question: collective mindset for a team. You're only two games in, and you've gotten a win and a loss. What ultimately is the role of uh, of the of the mental part of it when it's confidence or lack thereof in terms of playing to your best? Even if you don't don't get a result you want against an excellent football team in Madison, people would expect Mad- uh, Wisconsin to to play well this weekend. But in terms of keeping the collective group together and not letting things splinter away, you know I think it uh, all starts from the top. Uh, you know with Co- with Coach Galani, and he's done a really good job with it and. And uh, the development of the kids in in the off season and just their belief and and uh, I think it's I think it's very important for us to as we go you know win lose or draw and you look at uh, you look you look at our goals again and just figure out okay can we still make a bowl game can we still play in in uh, you know uh, can we still win all our our rivalries and, and just, I mean, your goals are still in front of you at the end of the day and and uh, we can't let one loss. Um, end up being two losses because of that you know and so we've got to bounce back and and put, uh, watch the film make the corrections that we need to make and and to come back but belief definitely is important in all of that you know i think when kids believe and they believe that you can win they believe that they believe on the other side of the ball too you know if the defense believes in the offense offense and the defense then they're they, they're not just playing to play but they're playing because they really feel like they can win you know and i think that's huge how do you feel the team responded in practice after the big win at arizona Clearly, there's a lot of reasons to feel good about getting the result they got in week one. Did you sense or feel in any way any kind of either contentedness or letdown, or did you see, or did you see what you wanted to see last week in practice from your guys? Yeah, I, I thought they practiced hard. Um, you know, I didn't see any any uh, any any contentedness. Is that, is that, that, that how yeah. you say the word? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody was content. Um, but uh, no, you know, I I didn't sense it, I didn't feel it. I thought they came out and played hard against Cal. You know, credit to Cal for for what they did. But um, I don't I don't think that uh, we had too many guys that were sitting on a high horse thinking that we can just run through these guys. I thought that it was uh, it was good for us to come out. I mean, I I do think that there were several times in the game where we could have blew the top off of it. You know, with a, with a couple of big plays on either offense or defense. But uh, the fact that we let them hang around even shows the belief. You know, I think that at one point. Cal was kind of like, okay, well, I think we can actually hang in there and do it because uh, the energy was was electric on mm-hmm. Saturday, and and uh, I think that there was a little bit of, uh, I I really felt like Cal at some points of the game were feeling like, okay, they're about to run it away, run away from us, but uh, we just we just never took advantage of opportunities, and and it kind of gave to their belief, and they started playing better. In the end, it was a three point game, and as I mentioned with Coach Lamb in the first half hour. Uh, close games have kind of been the thing for this BYU team. Uh, since Kalani's been the head coach, 13 of the 28 games, almost half have been seven points or fewer at the end of the day. And so you are playing a lot of uh, close margin, narrow margin for error type games. Where And, you know, it's not just coach speak when they say it's a handful of plays, game in, game out, that's making the difference between winning and losing right now. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. When you were saying that, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, in close games, we got to have more sacks. <laughs> Just the D-line coach and this coordinator in me was like, so been in a lot of close ones, and uh, and uh, we've got to – I don't think we have to, you know, start pressing or pushing. I think that will come as we continue to, 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 to practice and just believe and keep playing. I think that uh, – Things things will start to happen for us. What's uh, what's probably your uh, your blitz rate right now do you th- through two games? Not an automatic, not not a necessarily a precise number, but uh, how often do you think you've been uh, sending guys? Probably thirty percent. Yep, about thirty percent is is what I think is is correct. Um, you know, and I I don't I don't have a preference as far as going in saying okay I want to blitz this many times. I think every ta- every game has its own personality and and uh, everything is kind of played to to what you think you're going to get as far as you know make making a quarterback earn it or hey some of these blitzes we're giving them a lot of easy ones or you know whatever it is. I think every game has a different personality, um, but. Percentage-wise, I think we're at about 30 right now. Okay. Uh, from Twitter, Todd asking, it seems many of the defensive backs get called for PI when they fail to turn towards and play the football when thrown. How key is the teaching of this technique to defensive backs to play the ball at that critical moment? Yeah, no, it's it's key, and that's that's exactly right. We we teach that. Um, you know, getting a kid to do it, obviously, that, that's coaching in general, right? In every single position is is getting a coach to do uh, what, what you're coaching them to do and, 
I mean, uh, you know, it's. I think it's just a lot of it is just reps, 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 and time, and just them seeing it over and over. And then, you know, a kid does it in practice, and it works, and then they, they start to, you know, trust it a little bit more and do it more often. Some kids just have a natural knack for it, you know, or um, former receivers and kids that are really good ball skills and just kind of tracking the ball really good, and they're always looking for interception. I think the young crew, the young crew has shown in practice um, that they have the capability to do that. And uh, we got to have them continue to push the old guys, so the old guys can't can't say, you know, can't continue to play the way they are. Hey, mm-hmm. you don't you don't start turning, getting some of these balls that these quarterbacks are throwing up, then these young guys are going to pass you up, and that that's, I think that's good healthy competition for all of them. And there are young guys there to press the old guys right now for sure. We saw them on Saturday. Coach Tuiaki, thanks for coming in today. Good having you in studio, and uh, we will see you, I think, uh, again next week here on the Coordinators Corner. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, E. That is a wrap for the Coordinator's Corner. Next week, we visit with coaches Tuiaki and Grimes as we recap the Wisconsin game and get set for another home game with McNeese State making a first trip to Provo. Thanks to producer Jason Shepard, Michael Miner, and the crew from BYU TV and from BYU Radio, Sean O'Neill, Terry South, Sean Fay, Sterling Richards, and Don Shaline. I'm Greg Grubel. This has been the Coordinator's Corner. We'll talk to you next week at 1 o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Mountain. So long. Very sorry to hear about your father. Man without a horse like a man without legs. He's yours. I can look after myself. I think your plan was someone else's daughter. He's not a lad, he's a man. Blue runs deep on B.